your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Everybody and welcome once again to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Pair X Radio Network. I kind of hope the opening music intrigued you because it was called uh, Supernatural Radio Studio A by Kevin McLeod. And that's probably what people listening to mysteries and ghost stories and detective stories might have heard when they were listening to their radio programs way back at the turn of the last century. And um, the opening music just always seems to kind of set the mood and... Tonight's show is about occult detectives, and so I think it's a perfect fit. Now, Judica Illis is my guest, and I really enjoy it when she comes to visit, and not just because she's, you know, a leading authority on magic and mysticism and then the occult and the author of some of my very favorite books, like all of her encyclopedias and pretty much everything else, but she's also the editor of books like uh, The Wiser Book of, Fan- of the Fantastic and Forgotten and the Wiser Field Guide to Witches, and also the book that we're going to be talking about tonight called The Wiser Book of Occult Detectives. And I'm really anxious to get started, so Judica, welcome back. Thank you, Marla. I love being on your show. Oh, and I thank love you. that music. <laughs> I heard that, and I'm like, oh, because I, ha- I, I had told Sarge um, to go ahead and find something, because you know I wasn't sure I'd get the internet back in time. <laughs> and then I Got it back, and I heard that, and I went, no, Sarge, wait, we're going to do this one. It is perfect. I could listen to that all day. I'll, I'll get a loop for you, or I'll send you, <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the link. Oh. I want to live in like the house where the Adams family lived and <laughs> listen to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I heard that, and I was just like jumping up and down happy because it just absolutely fit. And okay, so let's let's kind of explain that um, Occult Detectives is a great collection of short stories, and they date back from the mid 1800s to the early 1920s, and that was pretty much at the height of the spiritualist movement, at least yeah. here, because yeah. um, that was what like 1848 when the Fox Sisters in New York, right. you know, made the headlines, and then, but at the same time. The late Victorian era in England was quite keen about the paranormal and the occult right about then, too. And there were just so many notables like Elizabeth Barrett Browning um, and Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and so the spiritualist and the spiritualism was kind of attracting people of all classes, including Queen Victoria. And, you know, when you're when your queen and her husband are participating in seances, it, it's kind of something that you might want to try yourself. Sure. So you know, I um I just did an interview with an astrologer um, about this book, 
and he was talking about Neptunian cycles, ah. and and that the the that period, the beginning of that period, coincides. And I I don't know the details, but it was very interesting. Well, the whole thing kind of just you know it it flips together. It, it's just almost kind of perfect. And I didn't. I don't know that I had read so many of them um, in the past, or maybe even unwittingly. You know, I just didn't know I was reading right. them. Right. Yeah, me too. See, me and, too. And, I mean, that's how this. That's how that book, this book, began, because all of a sudden I realized what I was reading. See, and and I read that you know you're a lover of detective stories and mysteries yourself. So this was like you know way way up your alley. So, I mean, when you were younger. Were you reading things and just into mysteries and the Agatha Christie's and all those Everything. things? Yeah, and yeah. I, I'm a I'm an obsessive reader. Uh, uh, I, I read almost compulsively. If there's mm-hmm. something in front of me, you know, I, I do. Re- if I'm sitting there with nothing else to read, uh-huh. I will read the box, the back of soup cans, and, <laughs> you know, the cereal boxes. I, 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 you know, and I learned how to read very young, and my mother also love mm-hmm. mysteries, both my parents. Mm-hmm. So I read Agatha Christie and um, Nancy Drew and that, you know, that whole genre of girl detectives. Sure, yeah. Plus, you know, you know, adult mysteries. Plus, um, we had esoteric fiction in the house. Although, you know, I, I tell people when I was telling people that, you know, what are you working on? I'm working on a book of occult detectives. People will say, oh, what is that? Right. Because they don't realize they know what it is. Mm-hmm. But in fact, when you start to talk about the genre, they go, oh, yes, of course. And I read um, a Marie Corelli novel. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, I, I know I was, you know, my childhood is split between my time in New York City and my time in New Jersey. So um, I can remember where I read something. I know roughly how old I was. And <laughs> this is my, my earlier childhood because we were still in New York. Mm-hmm. And um, it is a reincarnation love story, mm-hmm. which I, I, I also love. But there is what we what I now know as an occult detective mm-hmm. na- narrating the story. Live and learn, and and find out really great things. Um, yeah, I mean, and so so much of it is like, well, all right. You bring up in the book at one point that uh, modern day occult detectives are people that go on and do paranormal investigations. Yeah. In in part, you know, I yeah. mean, it, it's it's a label that kind of surpasses all different kind of things. But every time you see a ghost hunter on television. Mm-hmm. Although they might not call themselves an occult detective, right? They are. I mean, you know, if it walks like one and talks like one, <laughs> if you know, if you're if you are investigating these mysteries, it's it's a very fluid genre, and uh-huh. in some cases, the occult detective is actually investigating a crime and possibly mm-hmm. a mundane crime, not a mystical crime. Mm-hmm. But it it doesn't have to be. You know, it doesn't have to be a murder mystery or a theft. It mm-hmm. it could be a story about a haunting, for example, or, you know, mm-hmm. is there a ghost? Is there some sort of a cryptid? Is there something that is, you know, has an esoteric edge to it? You know, they all fall under the category of a cult. Yeah, practice. it's a, it's a wide umbrella because as yeah. I was reading this and I was reading about um occult mysteries and stuff, I did a fiction book. I mean, it's still sitting there doing nothing, but I did one about... <laughs> I have one, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mine is doing nothing, too. <laughs> well, maybe ours should join together and go on vacation or something. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a book about reincarnation and a story. Uh-huh. You know, it's kind of a murder mystery story, but it didn't intend to be. It was just like, you know, three people had an adventure back in the 1800s, and now they all show up again at the same time now and the same kind of dynamic, which wasn't always okay. great, you know, happened and stuff. And, and so I'm reading, I thought, ah, oh, I wrote a, an occult detective mystery story. <laughs> I did and I didn't even know I did. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's a really big genre. Now the, the book has um, 13 stories of supernatural sleuthing, um, which is, you know, just the appropriate number. 
did, did you get to choose the stories to be included? I chose, and yes. You did? Yeah. I chose the stories. I wrote the introduction and right. um, the way the way the book is structured, there is an introduction to the topic and a little bit of a history of mm-hmm. occult detectives. And then there are 13 stories. And um, before each story, I write a, a little intro to the story, which will tell you a little something about the history of the story, when it was, where and when it was published, and the author, and, and about the occult detective. Because there are 13 stories, and each of them features a different occult detective, Mm-hmm. And in some cases, not all of them, these occult detectives appeared in series in the way that Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple mm-hmm. appear in series, although clearly none of them with as much renown as any of those detectives. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, I've told you this before when you were on um, talking about the, fan- the book of the Fantastic yes. and the Forgotten, that these introductions that you write that precede each tale in the book are precious nuggets of information because they make the stories more interesting, they make the authors more interesting. There's so much insight just in that, you know, that paragraph or two that you put in there. Um, it's it's really amazing. And, well, you know, some of these stories are very obscure and hard to find. Uh-huh. Any place. And others are not necessarily. But in general, they're, you know, maybe maybe they're published in the context of being weird literature or old literature or strange literature, goofy <laughs> literature. But yeah. very rarely is the esoteric content taken, you know, treated with respect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was what I wanted to do with this book, and and it's a wiser publication, and wiser is a publisher that specializes in esoterica, mm-hmm. and so um, you know I I wanted to present it from that standpoint because occasionally I would you know and I I, I describe this in the introduction I occasionally I, I read collections of some of these authors and you know whoever is the editor clearly loves these stories, but. They talk about them with, they mock them and, you know, treat them with disrespect. And it bothered me. Uh, you know, I'm an occultist and I'm really, I'm, I feel like I'm part of the community mm-hmm. of either some of the authors who, you know, there's a Dion Fortune story here, there's an Algernon Blackwood story, mm-hmm. uh, Helena Blavatsky. So we have some major occultists, although not all of them, and right. also of the occult detectives also. I think I mm-hmm. they, you know, they weren't just figures of, you know, humor and butts of jokes. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the thing. And um, the interesting thing that I noticed was that some of the authors of the stories in this book didn't necessarily believe in the occult. I mean, it was kind of like J.K. Rowling, who has yeah. said many times that she doesn't believe in the kind of witchcraft she wrote about the Harry Potter series. But um, same thing goes for some of the, the storytellers right. in this book, um, except, well, like, Two, um, Helena Blavatsky and Dion Fortune were ranked, I looked them up, um, <laughs> you know, um, among the most influential occultists of the 20th century. Oh, and, and Algernon Blackwood, who was a member yes. of the Golden Dawn, and um, Bram Stoker, who uh-huh. we don't really know. He, well. he, he mingled in circles that included members of the Golden Dawn. Pamela Coleman Smith, who is the artist who illustrated the, the writer Waite Smith cards was, mm-hmm. you know, his friend. Yeah. So it, it's unclear how much he participated and how much he didn't. There's also uh, another writer who is not as well known as Dion Fortune and Helena Blavatsky, uh, Rose, Rose Champion de Crespini. Mm-hmm. And she, she, you know, she also wrote nonfiction, um, mm-hmm. occult literature. So, so she she, um, she took it seriously, you know. Although these stories are all entertainments, and anybody could read them and just enjoy them as stories. You, well, you yeah, can just read them on that level. Also, yeah, exactly. Um, some of them I I read were taken from true stories and turned into mm-hmm. you know the authors took them. Yeah, and, the and Helena Blavatsky. Yes. Yeah. She, or yeah. So she claimed. 
So she claimed and, and that, okay, that was, <laughs> all right, I got the book, I looked through it, I, I peered down the table of contents because just wanted to see if I had read any of them. And hers was the first one that came up. You know, that was I did the story that started this book, actually. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, very cool. Because I did the eeny meeny chili beanie pick, <laughs> you know, the, the very, the very big way. Well, I'm going to read this one, um, and it was called for people who don't know, the Cave of the Echoes. Yeah. Um, and you know, but I want to say, and then tell me the story about how this first one got it. But it's been such a long time since I've had the opportunity to just sit down and enjoy a work of fiction. Yeah, because I'm always reading books for you know people on the show and and guests yeah, coming on and they're all yeah. nonfiction and what all all that is. So, but I, it just reminded me just sitting back and reading this one story to get me started. Um, it transported me back into that different realm and and it made me realize how important reading is because mm-hmm. it's kind it's of a meditation. Pleasure. Yeah, I mean, we need this because in order to read a story, you have to concentrate on what you're reading with no real world distractions and it really is cleansing. And, you know, so people say, well, I don't have time to read, but with a book like this, a book of short yeah. stories, it's not like you have to sit down and read a 300-page novel. Yeah, so it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one story at a time. You can, you can write, read it in bits. That's, yeah, exactly. And, and you, you know, don't have to read it in any, any particular order. I mean, it's I arranged it chronologically just because it was sort of easier for me. But sure. you could read it in any order. Yeah, exactly, like I did um, with the Eeny, Meeny, Meeny, Meeny. <laughs> Well, but, h- how this book started, um, when I wrote... The Wiser Book of the Fantastic and Forgotten, or when I, I curated it, I compiled the stories. Mm-hmm. And, and very much as you were saying, Marla, I am, um, you know, I really enjoy putting these books together because it gives me the opportunity just to read for pleasure. Sure. And um, I noticed there are two occult detective stories in that book. And I, when I, when I started reading and I read, I had read some of Helena Blavatsky's occult fiction before, so I, I knew it existed. And when I started to read the story, I said, huh, look at this. There's <laughs> another detective. And at that point, I thought, you know, and you know, I never know. As an mm-hmm. author, and I, I probably, this is probably true of most, if not all authors, y- you write a book or you have a book published, you never know whether there will be another one. Mm-hmm. But I took a chance. I said, you know, we're. I'm going to put this one to the side because clearly there are a lot of these stories and they deserve a book of their own. Mm-hmm. And that was Cave of the Echoes. And then, you know, the yeah. book kind of. And then I talked them into letting me do this. <laughs> <laughs> you twisted those arms until they all said, Uncle. Yeah. Well, Fantastic and Forgotten was not my idea. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, there had been another book in that series previously, the Weiser Book of the Horror and the Occult, and they, right. you know, I was asked, would you like to do it? And I was happy to do it. And, I, you know, I was given a a title and, you know, go forth and find stories. And I did. <laughs> and I was, you know, really happy to do it. Right. But this book was, um, you know, the seed of this book. This was kind of my brainchild. So, mm-hmm. so, so, so you know. Please, please buy the book so I'm yeah. not proof wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and what I've said, too, about the other book and this one, you know, it, it's the time frame that they were written way back when. Yeah. Um, it's so different than picking up a modern day novel. And the writers, I mean, we have great writers now. We have many, many great authors out there. But back then, they were so able to paint mental pictures with words, maybe more so than some now. I think they had to in some cases. And I I do a lot of reading out loud and you know I I homeschooled my children way back when and I you know we we read out loud and authors who I really like like Charles Dickens, you know, my children and I and other kids would become impatient with and I realized it's because of the amount of detail. Yeah. But they you know, there was no television. There were no movies. They had to. They had to paint a portrait. They had to show us 
everything with words. And so they're mm-hmm. very, very, you know, there's a lot of attention paid to detail. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I, I like. I do too, but, you know, I wasn't used to it because I, I yeah. swear the first Anne Rice book I read, she has that much detail. In yeah. all her books, yeah, and I was really kind of surprised at first, and and a little bit impatient I was, mm-hmm. but then I came to realize, you know, as I was reading through it, that it really was kind of a different experience than reading, you know, whatever else I might have been reading. And so it was kind of, you know, she did it the old-fashioned way. But here's something a little bit not off-topic, but off the book for a second. Um, do you think reading is, uh, especially reading a real book, like holding it in your hands and turning the pages, do you think that might be becoming a lost art with the advent no. of things like audiobooks and Kindle? No? Um, I don't think so. I, I think they're all going to exist. Um, I think the people who prefer audiobooks, you know, I, I think the the way you process stories. hmm and narrative, you know, it, 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 it both affects your brain chemistry and responds to your brain chemistry. So I think that there are, you know, when I, I, I've taught in a classroom too, and there are, you know, not everyone reads the same way. And for there are people for whom reading is, is challenging and mm-hmm. the audio book is more enjoyable. Mm-hmm. I, I think what actually, th- I, I take a lot of public transportation, Mm-hmm. And so I see people on their phones and on their, you know, their their devices. I actually don't think it's like digital books that will threaten the paper book. It's games. People are on their phones. <laughs> they're on their social media. They're playing yeah. games. You know, solitaire. They're mm-hmm. that's. I think that's the threat. Um, yeah. The reading is really. Um, I, I think it's crucial for our mental health. I mean, there are a lot of benefits from reading, but you know, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to show somebody else's book. Um, there's a book called the, um, uh, I want to say it's the alphabet and the goddess or the goddess and the alphabet. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is a book about how as societies become literate, they also become more patriarchal and less friendly to the feminine divine. Mm-hmm. And, and how and, and it's it's an interesting book and in how brain yeah. chemistry changes when you go from an oral tradition to a written tradition. But I suspect going from a written tradition to a digital mm-hmm. will also affect our brain chemistry and, and maybe some of that in good ways. But yeah. um, I, I I think it's important to keep your hand in and read on paper too sometimes. Yeah, because you know I have. Although to, this book is available in you know in a digital well, edition for those who don't want it. the book, <laughs> it has yeah. to be. But yeah, I I have a Kindle and I've read books on Kindle. I mean, I even have a Kindle on my phone just in case yeah. I'm somewhere and really bored. I have a little library in there, but um, I don't enjoy reading it as much as holding a book in my hand and snuggling into a chair and and it's a different pages. experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I find when I travel, I take the Kindle. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because you can load it up on books, and you're never without yeah. something to read. Right. But it's it's a it's I like I like books mm-hmm. as objects. I I love beautiful books. Mm-hmm. And so the book itself is, you know, I, I would hate to think we would that we would stop publishing these beautiful 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 books. And you know, when you open a book and the paper, it's it's a very sensual experience. Yeah, I don't think books are going to go by the way. So there are too many bibliophiles that will fight it tooth and nail. And, um, you know, I mean, one of my favorite places, and and maybe yours, is going into an antiquarian bookstore. Yeah. And looking at Definitely. books from two, three hundred years ago, not quite that long. But, you know, I mean, just sure. Some it, of them. It's, it's Disneyland. It's a book Disneyland for me. And um, I, I think there are a lot more of... Me, I love like you. secondhand stores and, and library sales just to see see what mm-hmm. you can find. Yeah, it's like treasure hunting. It is. It's it's wonderful. And and I know one of the things when you know I kind of lost my house and everything a long time ago. Um, I lost five bookcases worth of books. Oh my god! And aside yeah. from <laughs> aside yeah. from the family pictures and stuff, I was broken hearted yeah. because a lot of them aren't in print anymore. No, no, no. Um, 
and I, I don't think people realize how quickly books sometimes go out of print. Yeah. I um, it, it it's sort of shocking. So, um, not digital books, but if you actually want to have a paper copy and you want to get yeah. it for a normal price, right? Yeah, you should probably get it. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you can find everything on the internet now, but yeah. Um, yeah, but, but some of them sometimes for extortionate prices, and you know, you know, it's like book scalping. The, the money is in going to either the author or the publisher. Or anybody who actually worked on the book, you know, the, if a if a book's list price is twenty four ninety five, and it's on eBay for five hundred dollars, uh-huh. that that's not going to to the author, the publisher, the illustrator, any of those people. No, and let me just say this: this shocked the heck out of me years and years ago, like a hundred years ago, when we were still writing books on on slate and chisels. Um, <laughs> It did a celebrity cookbook. It was the first book I ever wrote that got published. It was a tiny little paperback. Um, it, you know, the publisher folded right after they published it. I mean, I had a few copies and whatever. But I was looking, I looked it up just to see if Amazon might have had it. You know, years later, I thought, hmm, I wonder if anybody has a copy of that. You know, I always, I kept one for myself. That's the only one I've got. But I looked, and you know, it's those other sellers that you go to mm-hmm. to um, buy books that Amazon doesn't carry. And well, here you can find this one here. That little, you know, hundred and something page paperback on really cheap paper, and you know, I mean, it was decent recipes and stuff. But you know what I mean? It was just your little beginner book. Um, they wanted two hundred and fifty dollars for it. Oh yeah, and so, nobody. So, no, I mean, yeah, you know, but. It- it, it might be, yeah, but you don't know why somebody wants it. Every, you know, sometimes yeah. it's rare, and somebody might want it for a reason. Even, I mean, the reason there is a U.S. edition of Five Thousand Spells, my book Five Thousand Spells, mm-hmm. that book was published by a British division of Harper Collins, mm-hmm. who eventually stopped distributing in the United States, mm-hmm. and I was one of their very few U.S. authors. And so, for about six, you know. For a number of years, you could not obtain that book in the United States. And during that time, people were buying it on eBay for 500, 600 <laughs> more dollars. And eventually that came to the attention of, of, of the U.S. branch of HarperCollins, who, you know, who said, huh, yeah. you know, if people are doing this, maybe we should just put out a normal price book. And, and they did. Exactly. But, well, um, I got the I got the British one years and years ago. Yeah. I'm lucky. I've got a collector's item now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. They don't make the um, the original editions anymore. the I, The original editions were these gorgeous hardcovers with a dust jacket, and um, you know, if you yeah. if, if you're listening and you have one, don't lend that one. No, no. Because and I, I've they got they're a not making those online. anymore. Um, they uh, online booksellers wouldn't do free shipping. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's over five pounds in weight, <laughs> yeah. and so you know, and over the years they've they've come up with different covers, trying mm-hmm. to keep it affordable, yeah. um, and and you know, easy to mail. Mm-hmm. But those original the original ones, Encyclopedia of Witchcraft too, were just just beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think both. Yeah, both both of them. I'm just looking at them. They're both the same size and the same whatever. Yeah, so I guess I got that one early on too. See, before I even knew you, I was buying your book. <laughs> <laughs> who could, you know, who, uh, who would think it? Uh, but we, maybe we should get back to this book. Um, <laughs> it might be a good idea. Um, all right, in this book, it features both male and female authors yes. as well as male and female sleuths. Yeah. And so, again, we're going back, you know, 100 years or something almost. Um, how prevalent it- was was it back then to feature a female lead character in a story like this? There are, you know, in this particular genre, you find mm-hmm. them, and there are okay. quite a few female authors, and it is not in general, in literature in general, it's not particularly prevalent. But in the context of mysteries, mm-hmm. occult detectives were really the bottom of the bin. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they were not considered, you know, I mean respectable. They were not clever. Um, they, you know, and I, there's a little bit more of the history of this in the book, mm-hmm. but they were associated with pulp fiction and weird fiction, and because the occult aspects 
you know, people didn't believe in it. It was perceived as as, as the authors were cheating. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in, in other words, um, the goal was to create a mystery like Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. where it would be very clever and there would be an elaborate plot, and um, you know they would keep the reader guessing until the last minute and. If you figured it out, you thought you were so clever. <laughs> and the perception was that if, if there was some sort of an occult angle to it, the author was just being lazy and not coming up with this clever plot. Mm. Um, y- you know, so there was quite a... This, these stories were, even by authors who are now very respected, mm-hmm. These stories were perceived as disposable. They hmm. were most of them were originally printed in magazines, um, and, and many times they they were then collected into books. Mm-hmm. But they were originally magazines that were you know like your daily paper. You buy it, yeah. you read it, you throw it away. Mm-hmm. There was a name for that type of writing, but I can't remember. Uh, it was almost like the the serials that in the silent movies, pulp. you know. Yeah. But it was pulp fiction. There was some other, oh, Penny somethings, Penny, Penny Dreadfuls. Dreadfuls. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, something like that, yeah. And it, it just, it's just kind of amazing because if you think about it, if you, I mean, the, the first story that I read, The Cave of the Echoes, I kind of was waiting to see if I knew what was coming. You know, sort of, kind of, there were a couple of little hints maybe throughout, but, you know, it was just kind of a really interesting thing, and I, and I was pleasantly surprised that I didn't guess it completely, you know. It, it's, um, it's, it's quite a dramatic and very visual story, and I really yes. appreciated that. Uh-huh, um, it was, yeah. So even even if I kind of figured out the who done it, mm-hmm. I did not figure out the expose and how yeah, the, we were going to find out. Yeah. That, exactly. that I thought was very, very clever. I did too, you know, and I think we all do. We start looking for clues when we know there's a mystery there. We start looking for clues, furtively yeah. looking for clues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way it played out, I'm like, wow. And then when, you know, and, and it was relatively short. Um, yeah. And I was kind of disappointed <laughs> that it was over. <laughs> it was just like, oh, wow. You know, I mean, very concise. It, it's, you know, it's like elements of style. The shorter, the yeah. better kind of thing, right? And yeah. but it, was, it, it was really good. Um, well, I'll tell you an interesting thing. And I, mm-hmm. you know, this is only in the context of this book. A lot of, I found the stories by the women authors more concise mm-hmm. and tighter and I was, and I, I actually found myself wondering, is it because women, people become impatient with women faster, so they have to hurry up, so they learn to hurry up and tell the story? <laughs> uh, yeah, good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there is a real modern quality to a lot of the stories that are told yeah. by the female authors here, whereas some of the stories by the male authors who were actually, you know, in, in general, the more successful authors um, mm-hmm. are, you know, they take their time. Well, they feel they can be of leisure in doing yeah. it. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I think that there's no doubt that they're, you know, they're holding the floor. They're telling the story and we're going to listen. <laughs> exactly. And, and in, as far as the stories goes, I mean, the term occult detective is one that most of us can figure out, but not all occult detectives were cut from the same cloth. No. And that runs throughout the book. I mean, there are so many different kinds of stories and, and all, you know, like we said before, under that big umbrella. And, and for people who are not familiar with the concept of the occult detective, well, you are. You are. Because so much modern entertainment is based around the concept of the occult detective, the X-Files being, I, I think, the most famous, and mm-hmm. Supernatural, and Scooby-Doo, because <laughs> th- there are all sorts of, there just has to be an element of the esoteric. In some cases, you have a regular detective who finds themselves exploring something that is... Um, more complex and mysterious than anticipated. Mm-hmm. And 
and sometimes there is a genuine esoteric solution. Sometimes it, sometimes it really is a ghost. You know, sometimes it really is a vampire. But mm-hmm. sometimes, as with Scooby-Doo, what appears to be supernatural turns out to, you know, when you, when you, when you take the hood off the guy, it's just, it's just, it's just a greedy person. Um, mm-hmm. And that still would be considered part of a, a cult detective literature, the possibility mm-hmm. that it could be esoteric. And then you have some detectives who it's not the crime or the mystery that is esoteric. It's the actual detective where they are taking, um, adv- you know, in addition to deductive reasoning and good observational skills, they mm-hmm. may have some sort of um, an occult skill. They may be clairvoyant or, you know, uh, we, there's a dream detective here, which I just love. I love the concept of the dream detective who mm-hmm. goes to the scene of the crime and goes to sleep and dreams the solution. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a palmist. There's, there's a murder mystery solved by uh, a palmist. So, you know, and it's, and it's actually, you know, it's, it's a murder but it takes mm-hmm. the palmist to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's so many possibilities that it, there's like something for everybody, you know? It really yeah. is. Um, do you think that there were more women involved in and or practicing occultism back in the day when these stories were written than men? I don't know. I mm. don't know. I don't know what the statistics are. It's yeah. hard to say. Um, as with, you know, and I talk about this a little bit in my Encyclopedia of Witchcraft, it is mm-hmm. hard to say because, as the saying goes, Anonymous was a woman. Yeah. So the more renowned members have until recently been men, but I suspect that the numbers may actually be in favor of women. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, not not necessarily the most famous people. Right. But, but you know, go back in history and mostly, you know, you hear about witches as being women. And Well, it, even now, I mean, if you go to yeah. an occult conference, if you go to, you know, if you take a class, um, you know, proportionally, it, you know, I mean, and I, we can argue about why this is or this isn't, but, right. um, you know, proportionally, you'll have a larger number of women. Mm-hmm. I, and I really think there is an equal amount of men hiding in the reeds, you know. Um, Probably. Yeah, because it, you know, has always been, well, women, okay, well, we don't want to do what women do, but, you know, the, then you go into the thing about wizard, warlock, the, you know, all the terminology and stuff. Yeah, and, you know, maybe men had more to lose, I, I, you know, or maybe they weren't allowed to express those interests. You know, maybe mm-hmm. it was more, you know, in some ways... For, less transgressive for a woman to do it i you know yeah yeah i mean it's very questionable but i i just kind of think that a lot of a lot of men just kind of step out of the limelight when it comes to occultism or witchcraft or anything just because they don't think it's something that they should you know be known for or involved in you know i i always hesitate to engage in these stereotypes because (laughs) you know, <laughs> because, know. because because the you know the opposite end of that is the old witch hunt mm-hmm. concept of every woman a witch, right? And that's a dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I I think that I think that human beings are are wired mm-hmm. to to be interested in these topics, and mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of skills that people perceive as supernatural or paranormal, like telepathy or mm-hmm. you know the assorted clairs clairaudience clairvoyance mm-hmm. I, I i don't i think those are vestiges of old skills that we once had as a species yeah we did and I yeah i think so i think so because i think mm-hmm. you know at one point you know maybe it was more important for us to be telepathic more important for us to mm-hmm. you know to be psychokinetic or whatever it is. And yeah. as, as we've become more technologically adept or, you know, or, and we've lived, we live now in close proximity with each other, I, you know, you don't really need those skills as much or, you know, so it's a gift. Mm-hmm. 
been maybe not as needed as as it used to be. Right. Um, I think probably I everybody has this those skills, I but they're so. just so far back. Yeah. That, you know, and I mean, I mean it's kind of like afraid of them, depending on your childhood, or and don't where you believe come in from. them. Yeah. 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 Although I find it very sad when you don't believe in something that you can do yourself. I was find that very sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing, you know, it's one thing not to believe in something that, you know, oh, wow, I don't believe there's this, this plant that grows on the other side of the world that I've never seen. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, you know I, I'm not sure if it's a Photoshop picture. But if it's a skill that you actually have mm-hmm. or have observed in somebody else up close and personal, I think it's very sad. I mean, that's, I, don't, I don't even know if that's belief anymore. That's just denial of yeah. reality. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Um, now, we talked about Arthur Conan Doyle before yeah. um, as the creator of Sherlock Holmes, but he was very committed to spiritualism. He wrote yeah. several books on the subject. Spiritualist. Yeah. Uh huh. But the story he wrote that's included in this anthology um, had nothing to do with Sherlock Holmes. It's called The Leather Funnel, and it doesn't feature Holmes. And I was reading in the introduction to the story that and I didn't know this about Doyle, that he created many other fictional detectives, yeah. you know, in, in, yeah. including Several one in this yeah. story. And they weren't yeah. as popular as Sherlock Holmes or, or for you whatever You know, he reason. did not love Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> he, he felt very trapped by Sherlock Holmes. Mm-hmm. By, um, you know, he was, he was a committed spiritualist who also wrote these very spiritual books, mm-hmm. fiction and nonfiction, and really wanted, you know, at, at a time when that was popular, and I think felt very sidelined as the author of Sherlock Holmes. And that's why he had, you know, at one point tried to kill him off. But <laughs> yeah. people, wa- you know, people wanted him back, and, and mm-hmm. you know, he needed the money also. So, um, yeah, I was know, Sherlock trying- came back <laughs> from the yeah, dead. Yeah, he did. And, and I, I was kind of thinking, well, maybe he created the Holmes character to be more dimensional in a way than some of the other ones or yeah. had many layers or maybe it was easier to write for some of the others. I mean, yeah, it, it's kind of a big mystery, but nobody wants to be typecast, you yeah. know, I mean, bottom I, line. And This story, the, it's, it's a story called The Leonard Fu- Le- Leather Funnel starring uh, the cult detective Lionel Dacre and it takes place in Paris. And mm-hmm. I, I found it one of the creepier stories. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very well written um, and based on an actual witchcraft case. And I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give people spoilers, but I, I found that one a creepy story. Good. I'm going to get that one later tonight. Um, <laughs> read that. And, yeah, I mean, I love creepy stories and things like that. It just was, it was curious to me because, like I said, I don't know that much about occult detectives and, and stuff. And I, now that I realize that I probably have read more than I thought I had, but yeah. I didn't know that. I, I fell into the, the thing that Conan Doyle was typecast as, you know, the guy that everybody's going to know, Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle. And, Everybody and for, does, sure. And forget everything else. So I was really happy to find out about that. That kind of, you know, made me smile. See, this is the thing. I learned stuff from your book, and I hate to admit it, but every time I read your books, I learn a lot. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Oh, no, don't. No, 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 no. Okay. You know, I always think that's not a waste of day when you learn something. Like no. every day, like I was caught, every day you should try to learn something. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, at the end of the day, like, did you learn anything? So yeah. if I can be of service, that makes me really happy. Oh, you are. Yeah, you've you've increased my brain capacity quite a bit over the years. Seriously, but you know what can you I know, because say? because occultists mm-hmm. and spiritual topics and the esoteric, it's it's smart and it's intelligent mm-hmm. and it's full of information. And I I don't think that a lot of the stereotypes are you know people who are interested in this thing are just you know they're foolish and they're ignorant and they're not you know it's it's actually quite the opposite Mm -hmm. i I find most people who are interested in these topics quite well read and it and it makes you think Mm -hmm. and makes you consider possibilities and and that's i i I think that's important and i just posted my favorite saying on facebook the other day you know i'm paraphrasing but it's like it's a shame when people live in the black and white because there's so much more to find in the grays, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think that's true. And it does, I was going to say, it does make you think when you read this kind of thing. And, yeah. and it, it kind of shakes up the brain cells. Yeah, I think so. Is, which is, you know, a good thing. Now, all right, so I would be really remiss in doing an interview with you. If I neglected, here you know something's coming, hang, hang on to your seat. Um, if I neglected to point out something that immediately caught my eye and made me chuckle. And just to set the record straight so as not to confuse some people, which is do actually chuckle at times as well as cackle. <laughs> as let, well let, as cackle. <laughs> yeah, let's make, that, let, let's make that pretty clear. We can be versatile, right? All right. But, we have a um, wide range. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we can even chortle at times. Um, but that's a whole other story. Um, but this time the chuckle came in the press release before I even opened the book. And it was just three little words that made me laugh out loud this time. And I had no clue where they went and how they fit in. But the three little words were phantom monkey demons. <laughs> green tea. All right. So tell the me about it. story tell- is green yeah. tea. And I don't want to give away too much of the story. But there is a story in here called Green Tea by, um, it's a second story in the book, um, by Sheridan Lissanu, who is more famous as the author of Carmilla, which is a a vampire novella. I'm going to be really honest with you. I wanted to include Carmilla because I love that novella. And it features the same occult detective, Dr. Cecilius. Um, Dracula, a lot of people think that Van Helsing is the first occult detective, but the name of Van Helsing was a little, but Bram Stoker was a friend of Sheridan Le Fanu, and mm-hmm. um, Van Helsing is a little bit of an anagram of uh, Dr. Hesse. I mean, there's a whole thing in, in, in there, but oh. um, the story is too long. And I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to fit 13 stories in here. We would have been down to like five and, you know. Mm. I, that that would have been, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe it would have been disappointing to have so few stories. So uh, I am a lover of tea. I uh. drink tea all day long, black tea, mm-hmm. green tea, white tea. Um, you know, if it's tea, I like it. And mm-hmm. so um, I drink it in medicinal doses. And uh, <laughs> I, I found the story a little concerning originally because what happens when you drink too much green tea, <laughs> and and what will you see, <laughs> as opposed to the pink elephants you might see oh, drink other things? Well, oh. well, <laughs> um, <laughs> three words: phantom uh, monkey demons. <laughs> demons! Oh my God, that is hysterical. Yeah, uh-huh. I wonder how much is too much. How uh, you know? How much do you have to dose yourself before you see the demons? The well, there, there, demons. Is, there is actually a physician who wrote. Who wrote? Um, I, I, there's a little um, footnote in the book because I actually found a physician who who commented on on the story for that reason, and I don't want to give it away. But <laughs> um, but I, I sleep better at night now. You know, those of us who who perhaps indulge too much in, in Camellia sinensis, we're okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> that's, that's good because, you know, I, I will always find something that just stops me in my tracks. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. You know, glad. I mean, we'll go back to the, you know, the, the saints and whatever and, and Baba yeah. Lou, that guy, you know, and the Lucy thing. And, I mean, every book of yours that I pick up that we've talked about, there have been, you know, two little words, three little words, something strange. Um it's the yeah, story and, Green and, Tea, and that is that is a thought provoking story. Um, Doctor Hesselius is a physician, and he um, he featured in a book. There are maybe half a dozen stories with him, and um, he's probably more active in this story than in some of the others. They're taken from the case from his case files. Because you know he's no longer with us, even as the story starts. But his executor is going through his files, and mm-hmm. very much like Sherlock Holmes with Watson, that format of having this brilliant detective who sees things one way or another that mm-hmm. everybody else doesn't, accompanied by a sidekick who, you know, translates the stories for you know, us mere mortals. 
<laughs> you'll see that in, in, in several of these occult detective stories also. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, now that that settles the phantom monkey demons, and, and <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. So you, you, you I no, really I will, like that story. No, I will definitely read the story. I just, <laughs> I just get the giggles sometimes when I see stuff because you put really interesting things in. You know, I mean, where else are you going to find a book that has that? You know, phantom <laughs> demons. Come on, seriously. <laughs> Just doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. So, I mean, and all right, for people in general that may not, um, you know, be familiar, just the names of some of these stories are completely, completely going to grab you in. I mean, um, The Horse of the Invisible. Mm, yeah. That's interesting. Um, the story of Yand Manor House. That's not bad. The Leather Funnel, I, I thought that was real clever. I was trying to figure that one out, but I, I will have to read it. Um, ooh, The Victim of Higher Space. That's an interesting story. And The Return of the Ritual. Yeah, I mean, these all these things are, are named so well. The Eyes of Doom, come on. <laughs> you know, just that enough is going to to get you into the story and the genre. Yeah. Um, it's really fascinating, and like I said before, we've you know you we've got the book covers murder, covers demons, covers ghosts, covers shamans, um, something for everyone. <laughs> and, and it's a good so, vampire story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, it's called called the vampire. I mean, you can't miss it. <laughs> can't miss it. No, yeah. No, okay. it's perhaps not one of the more evocatively titled stories, <laughs> but it's a very good story. Some of the stories are. I mean, if you like it, if you like a chiller, some of them are. Some I found some of them frightening. Oh yeah, um, like what? You know, not not a. I mean, not having written read them six. The the vampire was. Um, yeah. Uh, had a little bit of an edge to it. Green tea has an edge to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and not all of them. You know, the the, right. the the higher space one is is a really interesting story. Mm-hmm. In, in a thought-provoking story, but not a scary story. Um, right. But I, the leather funnel. Um, yeah, there, there are. Did, did you? You didn't read the pot of tulips, did you? Not yet. That's the first story. Yeah, not so yet. The pot of tulips. I knew I wanted to put in this book because I knew that story already, and it is the oldest story in here. It's from 1855, and I have loved that story for years because it. It takes place in Manhattan, in New York City. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it is assuming it's being narrated in 1855 by the occult detective. He's mm-hmm. talking. Um, he's an older man, and he's talking about something that happened to him in his youth. And he mm-hmm. and he talks about Midtown Manhattan at a time when it was where people went for the summer. Um, really? He, yeah, it's rural. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> the rustic delights of Midtown Mid- Manhattan. Oh and I God. just, as somebody who I, I worked in that part of Manhattan for years, mm-hmm. and I, I, I know it well, and just the concept of, you know, I don't know, the bucolic pleasures of Madison Square. I, yeah. I, I really just, I, I just to, to me, that's just mind-blowing. And yeah. 1855, you know, it is. It's a long time ago. But if you mm-hmm. do any kind of genealogy... I mean, 1855 is like my, you know, great grandparents. It's not mm-hmm. 20 generations ago. No, no, it isn't. Wow, I can't even imagine Midtown Manhattan being, you know, yeah, rural. And it's, yeah, they it's go like, uptown to, you know, in the summertime to, you know, escape the crowds and the heat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was kind of surprised when I wrote the Ghosts of Hollywood books because I did a lot of the history of Hollywood. And I, at the time, I mean, I knew it was all farmland. I knew, you know, Native Americans lived here. Yeah. Um, but I didn't realize that there was a law against walking a herd of cows down the main street <laughs> after five o'clock kind of thing. You wow. know? Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, you hear that stuff and it's like, whoa, yeah, way back when. And it's really interesting, especially if you're familiar with the territory. Yeah, it's a, it's like you read it, and it's like a time travel. Like uh-huh. I can I can see where he's talking about. There's a a beautiful garden with a topiary. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. it, it's it's unbelievable. Um, but but you know he lived in Manhattan. The author lived in Manhattan. He was an Irish author 
who had moved to New York City. And, um, you That's know, he, he, it's, it's, he, it's not, he was, he was writing fiction, but he was writing something that was um, true to its time. Yeah. I mean, it's, you don't need the TARDIS to travel when you can read a book. <laughs> Seriously. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, as much as I would like to be the companion and, you know, hang out, um, you know, that's not going to happen. So I'll just pick up a book and, and do the yeah. same thing. Yeah, and we're yeah. running a little short now. God, it just goes by so much, so fast when you're here. Yeah. Um, so are you going to take a hiatus from your busy schedule all over the place for the holidays? Or are you going to still be keeping up the same hectic schedule? No, I, I, I'm off the road. I don't like traveling in the winter because I don't like the snow. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, flights get canceled. I don't, right. I don't like it. So mm-hmm. I am off the road till the spring, and I'm going to try to get some writing of my own done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, and just, just uh, hibernate. Well, that's good. And, you know, I usually, you know very well that I ask my guests where people can find them and where they can find their books and the classes and the events and the workshops and all the rest. But I'm guessing that it's an easier bet for some, like you, just to give out your website address because everything they need to know well, is right there. Right? Yeah, although my poor website, it really needs to be updated. I don't even have my new book on there and I, I have to put my events up. But my my website is uh, my name, www.judikailles.com and that will link you to my Facebook and my Twitter, which are more up to date. Um <laughs> But yeah, that's one of my plans for the winter is to get all that stuff up and running because I've been I've been running around too much and, and things have fallen by the wayside. And the I book know. is available really wherever wherever fine books are fine sold. Fine books are can. sold. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Online, offline, small stores, big stores. Yeah. And if and you can't find my book or anybody else's book, mm-hmm. you, you could ask you can ask a bookseller to order it for you. They should not charge you anything extra for it right um because they just sometimes can't keep a a wide stock on their shelves but Mm -hmm. most booksellers are happy to get you a book if you're not in too much of a hurry and i think it's important to um support our independent independent booksellers as well you know yeah um so yeah that's that's a very good deal all right so you can be found on facebook you can be found on twitter you can be found at your website and you know it was really nice to talk about a, a fiction thing this yeah. time. You it's know? always nice to talk with you, Marla, really. Well, thank you. And, and you know, I feel the same way. And so are you working on anything that I can look forward to yet? I hope so. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I hope so. I'm working on what hopefully will be another big book. Um, right. But, yeah. but um, you know, I, I, I keep my secrets <laughs> until, yeah, sometimes until they're have. ready to be revealed. Yes, yes, that's fine. <laughs> I do the same. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for um, popping in and spending the hour with me and everybody thank else. You. And you know, it won't be the last time. I hope not. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for listening in tonight as well, whether you're listening live or you're going to be listening on the podcast and all podcasts and all things you can find at marlabrooks.com. Everything you need, books and things, everything I just said about Judica's stuff, you can all find on my, my thing, too. So, one-stop shop to find all the good information. So, until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com. 